Hey guys, welcome to Urology Biology. Now on this episode, I have received in the strangest AliExpress watch that I could find out there. Now this one's mad strange. This is the Ilang Double Balance, and it's a $47 AliExpress watch, which is pretty damn cheap. And I couldn't resist opening this up and finding out exactly how it's working, because this thing has got two balance wheels. Now, Ilang refer to this as the double tourbillon, and it is absolutely not a tourbillon watch. Don't believe what they say. If you want a tourbillon, you go to Breguet. They're the guys that know how to build tourbillons. This simply has got two balance wheels, but don't be under any illusion that that is something very simple. It's not. And I was really, really curious about how exactly this worked from a mechanical point of view. And of course, I want to know if I can make this run a lot better than it did when I got it out of the box. So continuing with the series, I am going to completely strip this watch down to its bare bones, run it through the cleaning machine, rebuild it, regulate it, and see if I can get it running a lot better than the timographer results that you can see on the screen right now. This thing was erratic. It started off not too bad, but then it just got mad strange. And I was actually really curious about why. I was actually wondering if the timographer was getting confused because there were two balance wheels and maybe there was some phasing going out with the frequency. I'm not too sure. So the first thing that we need to do is obviously get the movement out of the case. And I was really surprised to find out that it actually had a screw back instead of a snap back case back. So that's why I had to use my industrial case back remover to get this thing off because it was on pretty damn tight. So the first thing that I'm going to do is remove the rotor from the watch. And I was pleasantly surprised as well to see that there's a lot of blue screws here. Blue screws add a nice touch to a movement, nice color contrast. They're not traditionally heat treated blue screws, so don't be under any illusion that they're not. In my opinion, they're just simply painted. So I need to obviously be a bit careful with when I'm unscrewing them because I obviously don't want to scratch that blue paint off of them. But if you're careful, then you're pretty much going to be able to do it without any real issues. Next, of course, we need to remove this movement holder, which is just a generical plastic looking thing, but it's holding obviously everything in place and there's no movement holder screws at all. And of course, we can then just flip it over and pop the entire movement with the dial and hands out and lay it on the bench. And it is a really, really big watch and it's heavy as well. That's another thing that I noticed. So guys, don't forget, if you want your chance to win a 1960s Roma Stingray with a Valju 72 inside, fully serviced, worth around $2,000, then all you need to do is subscribe to this channel and like the video. Once the channel hits 100,000 subscribers, I will be giving this watch away completely free to one lucky subscriber. Now the dial is held in with two dial feed screws, one on each side of the movement. And it's actually nice to see that they've used dial feed screws properly and not used some kind of sticky substance to hold that dial in place. Because I've seen that before on these watches and it's not fresh. No sir, it's not. Once the dial's been removed, I'm going to put this aside and keep everything safe. And there's really not that much of a dial there going on, as you can see. So much of it is open and exposed, because obviously they're going to be using the double balances as a show piece. And yeah, I get that. It's a nice touch. It's nice to look at, obviously, seeing these oscillating. And why not? Now, I've put the movement onto a movement holder and I'm going to break down the automatic works. The rotor's obviously been removed and now I'm just taking off this big bridge, which is exposing the two reversing wheels and what looks like another driving wheel underneath. There's also a very small wheel, which seems to just literally just sit flat on top of a jewel for where the rotor screws in. So I had to also be careful with that not to lose it. And then next, I'm actually winding down the watch. And as you can see, straight off the bat on that, it looks like there's actually two ratchet wheels. So when I'm seeing two ratchet wheels, I'm assuming that there's two mainspring barrels. But then I'm thinking, why has this watch got two mainsprings? That's weird. Surely it cannot be the case. But we're going to find out later on. Now, flipping the movement over onto the dial side, where the balances are in this particular movement, I need to take these off carefully. And of course, with this being a cheaper watch, obviously the quality of it is not as good as traditional Swiss watches, so I also need to be really careful. Now, once the balances have been removed, obviously underneath you can now see that each balance has got its own set of pallet forks with a pallet fork bridge. So then, of course, I'm led to assume that I'm going to be right in regards to saying this, that it will have two mainsprings, and of course it's going to have its own independent train of wheels for each balance. How cool is that? It's a big movement. I'm not going to lie. It really is. But still, to have its own independent system going on, 
it's going to be very interesting to see how it looks once we fully break it down. So recently I received in a lot of new HB and Enica stickers and I want to give these away to subscribers of the channel. All you need to do is leave a comment on this video and on my next video I will announce my favorite comment that I liked of who has won. So guys, be creative, leave your comments below and you might be in with a shot of winning a sticker. I'm going to be rolling this out on all of my future videos. So what are you waiting for? So with the movement flipped back over, I can obviously tackle the other side. I've removed the two ratchet wheels and I've removed this central crown wheel, which did have a reverse threaded screw. I'm not even sure if we can actually call that a crown wheel or if there's two crown wheels, because what I'm removing right now is technically a crown wheel, which is held in with the three screws. But it is actually nice that they did actually mark it as a correctly reverse threaded screw. Also remove the click as well, and now I can remove the barrel bridge. Held in with these three screws, two are the same and one is a little bit smaller, and I can just lift this off with my tweezers, and it's pretty big. And as suspected underneath, like we've just mentioned, there are two mainspring barrels. Both completely identical, one on each side, and I'm just going to take those out of the movement and lay them to one side until I break them down later on. And as we can see, we have got two train of wheel bridges. So I'm going to deal with this one on the left. And then, of course, there's the other one on the right. Held in with the two blue screws. And then we can simply just lift it off with the tweezers and see exactly what we're dealing with underneath. Now, underneath, you have got a traditional train of wheel bridge set. And the last ones, I believe the third wheel, has got a cannon pinion built onto it. And there's one on each side. So from my understanding now, the way that this watch is working is one side is actually controlling the hour and the minute to one balance and the other balance system is controlling the seconds sweeper. So with the movement flipped back over once again, I can now remove this huge plate, which is obviously going to show us the keyless works and motion works underneath. So removing what looks like a washer. I can then expose the uh, minute wheel and obviously the intermediate wheels underneath this little plate. And again, everything is pretty straightforward as far as I can see. Removing the hour wheel and the intermediate wheel, the minute wheel's just gone, obviously. And then the only thing that we're left with after this is obviously the keyless works. So first of all, I'm going to remove the screw for the setting lever spring. Gently removing that because you need to be careful as well, because underneath you are going to have a yoke spring, which is going to be held under a lot of tension. So hold that down with a little bit of peg wood or a piece of plastic so that it doesn't fly across the room. Next, I can remove the yoke. And then what you're left with is the setting lever screw. This one is actually not a screw, it's just a push post, as you can see. And then I can put those also to one side. You have the winding pinion and the sliding pinion underneath as well. And of course, the winding stem with the crown, which has all been removed. Big thank you, of course, to all the HB members and the Patreons of the channel. All of your names are up on the screen. So guys, as always, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for supporting what I do. And if you want the full long versions of these videos, they are available on the Patreon and also as a member of the Horology Biology channel. So last but not least, we need to remove the mainspring from these two barrels. You can simply just pop open the barrel with a pair of tweezers. It's friction fit and that's going to expose the mainspring and the arbor inside. Now just gently remove the arbor with a pair of tweezers. And then of course you need to remove the mainspring as well. Now, the way that I do it is I just use a little screwdriver to get my finger underneath the spring and then I will just work it out with my finger and thumb so that I can get it out of that barrel without it flying across the room. It's not cool flying across the room. No, sir, it's not. Once that's been done, I put the balances back onto the main plate. It's to keep everything safe for when I run it through the cleaning machine and it really is the best place to keep your balances so that you don't damage your hair springs. Simply screw those back on and they're going to be good to go for the cleaning machine. And there we have it, guys, all of the parts to this watch. And there's quite a lot of parts because, well, it's pretty much double when you think about it because of the two balances.
So all the parts have been cleaned and dried and now we're ready to fully rebuild this watch. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to tackle the mainsprings and I'm going to treat this with the respect like I would service in any watch. I'm going to use the same oils that I would use, the same greases, etc. And first what you could see is I was applying that black stuff. That is chrono grease. It is worth more than its weight in gold. Trust me, it's very expensive. But it is a braking grease that is used on automatic watches and it's very, very important. I'm also going to be putting the mainsprings into my winders so that I can put these back into the mainspring barrels. And of course, we're having to do everything twice because, well, we have two barrels. Now, gently removing the mainspring winder while I'm holding the spring back in with some tweezers because I don't want it to jump out by accident. Dabbing off any like shavings from metal, etc., which can happen with some Rodico. And then I just press this with the plunger straight direct into the barrel so that it fits in nice and snug. In goes the arbor, making sure that it hooks into the spring correctly. And then I can add a little bit of 1300 to the wall of the arbor. And I also add a little bit of extra 1300 on top of the spring as well for lubrication. Simply just offer the barrel lid as well. And then you can press this back on all friction fit. And then of course, repeat the process on the second one, which I'm not going to show you because you don't need to see it. It's exactly the same. Now for, because it is a double balanced watch, we're going to deal with four capstones instead of two. So you have got the two on top of the balances and then you've got two on the underside, on the dial side, so to speak. And what you do is you lift off the inker block setting. You will take out the capstone, separate the two pieces. I rub off any excess oil or dirt and then I will apply a little bit of fixer drop treatment so that when I oil the capstone, it keeps the oil all in one place. Once I've added the fixer drop, I will take it out with your tweezers, of course, and then I will just put this onto a piece of paper. Now I'm adding a little bit of 9010 just into the middle, as you can see, and then I pop on the capstone back, seal it up into place, and the oil will keep it all in place. And you're looking for that nice little round bubble of oil. I'll also put it back into the watch. Now, they're doing it on the dial side as well, and I'm showing you guys because there's so many of these capstones. It's not usually what we deal with on this channel. We usually deal with two, not four. No, sir. And again, I can offer these back straight into the watch. Now, once you've popped it back in, just simply lower your inker block setting, and then you will see the two little arms that you want to just hook underneath and it'll just seat it correctly in place. I also dab it off with some Rodico just to clean any dust away. Balances have been completely removed. And of course, now we can tackle building the watch. Now I'm going to do the train of wheels at the same time. I'm adding in these third wheels. They've got the cannon pinions on these, as you can see. And then I'm going to build up the rest of the train of wheels. So this is something that you really just want to take your time with. There's no rush. You just basically need to make sure that your pinions are all lining up with the corresponding jewels. Once I've done that in, I add in one of the mainspring barrels, and then I can also offer the train of wheels bridge to the one on the right, as you can clearly see. Again, making sure that all the pivots line up. And I'm using the mainspring barrel just to nudge it along so that I can see the movement before I fully screw everything down. Now, I held in with those two blue screws, as you can see, and then I'll repeat the process completely the same on the other side. The only difference, of course, with this one is we've got this central wheel where obviously the sweeper is going to go, adding in the escape wheel. And then I can build up the rest. So I added a little bit of 1300 as well onto this post before I slid it into place. And it just helps it go on a lot easier. It's very important that you do use the correct lubrication as well when you are oiling up your watch. So I use a combination of 1300 and 9010. I also use different greases as well depending on what component is going where. So bridge is on, everything's secure, and as you could see, I popped in that mainspring barrel upside down. I was a little confused at first. I thought, hey, where's the screw for where the ratchet wheel's going to go? And then I realized, 
was upside down, not fresh, but it happens. Now, once everything's in place, I can offer the barrel bridge to the movement, and that's held in with the three screws. Just gently holding it down with a plastic tool while I screw everything into place. Little bit of 1300 onto the posts. Adding on the little washer for where the crown wheel is going to live. And then I can put that in. That is obviously creating drive to both of the uh, mainsprings. And as you can see, it's a clearly marked reverse threaded screw. Adding in the click spring, and then I can pop in the click as well. Now I've added in the ratchet wheel on the right side, and now I've added it on the left side as well. And both of these are held in with just one large screw. You don't need to go crazy in regards to tightening these up. So a little 1300 just onto the side for where this crown wheel is going to go. Lining it up into place and then I can put the core of the crown wheel on top. And as you can see we've got three small screws. These are not reverse threaded screws at all. You will only have a reverse threaded screw if it is bang in the middle. It's to say it's to basically stop itself from unwinding itself. Once we've done that, we can get to the oiling. Now I'm using a combination of 1300 just on that center wheel, and then I'm using 9010 on the rest. And as you could see, it does happen sometimes. I used a little bit too much oil, so I removed it with some Rodico. Continue with the oiling, and then obviously I will repeat the entire process as well on the dial side. So adding in the setting lever screw and just adding in a little bit of 1300 on top. And unfortunately guys, my decoder messed up a little bit and I lost the footage of me rebuilding up the keyless works. But of course you have me removing the keyless works and the principle of rebuilding it is exactly the same. So I do apologize about that and I was not best pleased. No sir, I was not. So adding in the hour wheel, then I can add in the minute wheel, the intermediate wheels are in, and I'm just checking that everything is engaging correctly. I can also add on this little plate which is securing everything into place, and that's held in with just the one screw. Adding on this washer, I, re I think the reason for this is that you just basically just don't see it from the dial side, and it just keeps everything snug. And now I can add on this massive plate. I mean, it really is big. And this is held in with the three screws. Little bit of 1300 onto the posts. And also where this intermediate wheel is going to go. Now that intermediate wheel, that basically is driving all the power to the hour and the minute off of the train of wheels underneath just from this one little wheel we then add in another minute wheel and then of course we add on another fixed cannon pinion and of course an hour wheel on top and again these are all held down by one small plate and it's also held in with just the one screw just to keep everything secure So we're really getting close now to the full rebuild of this watch and I'm really curious about how it's going to be running. I'm actually oiling up the automatic work jewels here before I put in the wheels because there's going to be no way of accessing them afterwards. So this is the only way that it's going to be done. Adding in first the driving wheel and then you've got these two reversing wheels that go in. Now you can give these reversing wheels some better treatment which is like an oil treatment for them to help them run smoother. And if I'm honest, I completely forgot. There's no excuse. I just did. I forgot. Not gonna lie. Not gonna say that it was done out of video. No, it wasn't. I forgot. Once those are in place, I'm also adding that smaller wheel, which literally just sits loosely on top of a jewel. And I don't like that because it's not secure when you're putting on this bridge. So it was fiddly. It really, really was lining everything up. 
Now, once everything is lined up, hold it down with a piece of plastic or pegwood, gently turning your crown so that you can see that all your wheels are engaging. And once you know that it's all engaging, then you can go ahead and screw on that automatic bridge. Little bit of 90-10 to the jewels on top. And then we are gonna deal with the pallet forks. Now, as mentioned earlier, as you can see, it's got two pallet forks, not just one. So I'm adding fixer drop treatment to the pallet forks. I'm gonna blow off any excess fixer drop and I'm also gonna remove the fixer drop from the pinions. Offering it to the movement, making sure that it lines up into the jewel and then I can put the pallet bridge on top. Now that's held in with the two screws and I'm just gonna nip those up. Again, being very, very careful not to over tighten these because the last thing that you want to do is have them break. I'm also adding some wine to the watch as well. And then I'm checking that the pallet fork is engaging so that I can oil it. Now I add a little bit of oil just to the exit stone and then I will move the pallet forks a few times backwards and forwards so that all of the teeth of the escapement receive a little bit of oil. And now, of course, I can put the balance onto the watch. And what I'm going to do is I actually want to check the timographer while just one of the balance wheels is in to make sure that I can regulate it on this side. Held in with the two screws. And of course, it's running as expected. But the question is, is it actually going to run any good? So I'm adding a little bit of regulation to this, even though it's not been over 24 hours, and I just want to see if we can get a decent result. And as you can see on the screen, the result is actually pretty damn good. So I'm hoping that moving forward with the final regulation, it's going to look even better than what we've got here. Excuse the tongue. I have no idea what I was doing, but it had been a really long day. So I fitted the pallet forks, of course, to the other side. I'm not going to show that because it's the same principle. And then in goes the balance. And of course, the watch completely fires up. And I must admit, I am starting to really like how it looks with two balance wheels. It's just something quite cool and different and obviously not what you see every day. So I'm just offering the dial to the movement, making sure that I loosen the screws on the side of the movement so that I can press it on correctly. And then of course, nip it up completely so that it's nice and tight. And then of course, once I've done this, I can move over to just fit in the hands and we are getting that next step closer to the final results. So there's no date complication on this, so I can simply pop on the hour wheel wherever I want before I line it up to 12 o'clock. And then I will press this down with a hand press tool. It's all friction fit, so it's pretty straightforward. Of course, when you're offering your minute one, make sure that you line it up to 12 o'clock so that you've got them both bang on precise. And then you can press that on with your hand press tool. Same principle for the seconds hand, and it's a really big, long sweeper with a long post. And again, I'm just offering this with the hand press tool and just simply just press it down. All friction fit. So in the case, I have blown off any dust that was inside, and then I just gently offer the case to the movement, lower it down, and then I will flip it over upside down so that I can put in the movement holder. First, of course, the crown needs to go in, add in a little bit of grease as well to this before I put it inside the watch and it just nips into place. So put in the little washer that lives underneath the rotor offering it again to the movement. And then last but not least, I just need to put in this really big blue screw into the center for the rotor and making sure that it all is engaging correctly. In goes the movement holder, the plastic movement holder. There are no screws for this whatsoever. And then of course I can just ball up the watch before I will tighten it up correctly later on. Put it on the strap. 
And then of course I get to use my new toy, my Elmer D Mag. Quite expensive, but saves a lot of time. You simply place the movement onto the D Mag, you press the button for one second, also change the position, and it will send a pulse frequency, completely demagnetizing the watch entirely. And it works really, really well. So the final results on the timographer. We came in at around 280 degrees amplitude with a zero rate or plus two rate of fluctuation, which is really, really good for both balances on the watch. And I couldn't be happier. This runs a hell of a lot better than it did when it came out of the box. And there we have it, guys. The Ilang Double Balance $47 AliExpress watch. Guys, thank you so much for sticking with me to the end of this video. There are two more videos on the screen right now if you want some more super fresh, super nice watch restoration goodness. And as always, guys, until next time.